So uh, today I want to just talk on the topic of the evidence of salvation. So I'm still sort of covering in depth just the topic of salvation in general. But today I want to talk specifically and really just continuing from last week because, you know, last week we talked about assurance of salvation. And generally what gets tied into assurance of salvation is the evidence of salvation. And I'm just going to be talking about a couple of factors there. Uh, the evidence of salvation. But I'm going to sort of come at it from a different angle. And you'll see as I just sort of talk about it. I'm going to stretch it over this week and next week because there's a couple of things, quite a lot to cover. So I may not actually get to the answer uh, until next week. So we'll, uh, we'll take questions next week if you guys have any questions. But, you know, last week we talked about assurance of salvation. So we really addressed the question of how do I know that I have eternal life? And if you remember the conclusion we came to, because the Bible says you need to believe to be saved, then to know that you're saved, you need to make sure that you believe. So that's quite simple. But then, you know, somebody, you know, I, I, this is totally off topic, but when I, when I listen to my own videos and sermons just to see how I, preaching, how I preach, I realize I say you know a lot. Do you guys realize that? Maybe it's just me. Now you'll notice it <laughs> when I say it a lot. I don't know why I, I say it so much. It must be just something I've got a habit of saying. So somebody, you know, they'll say, well, okay, it's simple. If I want to know that I'm saved, I just need to believe. But then they might ask the question, but then how do I know I believe? Right? Because you say like, well, I, I want to know that I'm saved, so then I need to believe. Then they might ask, but then how, how do I know that I believe? Now, I believe people ask that themselves that question because they're trying to determine the existence of their faith. But I think they ask themselves that question because they're determining the existence of their faith by the wrong factors. And I want to cover a couple of those factors and sort of show you why they are not good reasons or not, not a good basis to determine whether or not you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first one I want to talk about is uh, your circumstances. So what do I mean by circumstances? I mean the circumstances surrounding you uh, leading up, to, the circumstances leading up to the point at which you believed on Jesus Christ. And I'll give you a couple of examples. But before I go into some of the circumstances, People might ask this question. They say, you know, I believe. They'll say something like this when we talk about circumstances. They'll say, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but did I believe the right way? I don't know if anyone has ever said that to you. They'll say, like, I believed on Jesus Christ, but did I believe the right way? And I'll go into a couple of them in a minute. But one thing first I just want to say is, you know, is there a right and wrong way to believe? Is there a right and wrong way to believe? See, I believe that how you come to the point of believing on Jesus Christ does not affect whether you do believe on Jesus Christ or whether you have believed on Jesus Christ. Uh, let me give you uh, an analogy. John, 10, uh, verse, John chapter 10, verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, isn't it interesting there, when I was sort of reading this verse when I was preparing, it says, I am the door, by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. And I just wonder whether that represents, you know, even though we're saved, we can, you know, walk in the spirit or we can walk in the flesh. We can be in the right pasture, we can be out of the pasture, but we're still his sheep. But the, the analogy I want to bring is, you know, Jesus says, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. So salvation is likened unto walking through a door. Now, so we all get saved the same way, don't we? We all get saved by believing on Jesus Christ. We all get sa saved by walking through this door. And to use the analogy of what we're discussing right now, which is circumstances, the reason why I don't believe circumstances change whether or not you believe is because 
how we get to that door doesn't change whether or not you walk through the door. And how we all get to that door different ways, don't we? We all have a different walk in life, you know, maybe a different intellectual reasoning of how we got there or different uh, emotional circumstances or whatever, you know, people that we met along the way. But at the end of the day, we all get saved the same way. We all get saved by walking through that door. How we get to that door doesn't change whether or not we can walk through that door. And that's why I don't think circumstances change whether or not you have believed on Jesus Christ, whether or not you do believe on Jesus Christ. So I think it's a silly way to determine if you do because of how you believe. There isn't a right or wrong way of how to believe um, because it doesn't change um, whether you do believe. Uh, but what are some ways people question how they believed and then they question whether or not they really believe and then they question whether or not they're actually saved. Well, one is, you know, you're unsure of the exact, exact date and time of well, the exact date and time when you called upon the Lord to be saved. And some people might say, well, I don't know if I ever did. Or, or they say, I don't know when I did. You know, I don't remember the exact day or date. You know, I don't have it written down in my Bible somewhere when I got saved. I just know that I believe now. And they might question whether or not they believe. John 3, Jesus says here, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, cometh and, whither, and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now a couple of the guys were talking about what this word listeth means. Um, in the dictionary it says to either choose or to please, but basically my understanding of it is when it says the wind bloweth where it listeth, it's, it's just wherever you desire, wherever you choose, wherever it chooses to go. And we can see even when you look at other verses in the Bible, you know, in James uh, 3, I think it is, or James 4, where it talks about the governor turning the ship about whithersoever the governor listeth. So he's controlling the ship wherever he chooses to go or wherever he desires to go. Um, but I just wanted to uh, just give a couple of thoughts on this verse here. It has nothing to do with the sermon, but I think what this verse is talking about, the wind bloweth, bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. What I think that verse is talking about, if you've ever wondered, is you, know, you can't see somebody's salvation, but you can hear their salvation because you can hear them confess the Lord Jesus. You can hear them say that they believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You can hear them say that they are believing on Jesus Christ. And you know, we talked about faith being manifested by words. So I think that's what this verse is talking about, is you can hear the wind, you can't see it. And it's the same with the Spirit. When somebody believes on Jesus Christ, you can hear that testimony that the Spirit is bearing witness in them and their spirit bears witness with the Spirit of God, but you can't see um, their salvation. But the reason why I'm going to this verse is, you know how the spiritual birth is likened to a physical birth. And you know, not everybody knows their physical birth date. date. I don't know if you've ever met somebody like that, but my grandma was somebody like that. We never really knew when her birthday was. And because the Chinese calendar uses the lunar calendar as well, so you know, do you use the birthday date of the, of the solar calendar or the lunar calendar? I guess that doesn't actually change which, which date it was. It doesn't matter how you reference it. But she did not know, and none of her children knew the day which she was born. They knew roughly the year she was born, but even that was disputed because when she passed away, there was, there was dispute over what uh, like birth date to put on her tombstone because nobody really knew exactly that date. Now, just because we didn't know the date of her birth, does that mean that she wasn't born? So you cannot know your birthday. It doesn't change whether or not you've been born. And I believe it's the same with your spiritual birth. You can know that you're born again. You can know that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it has nothing to do with knowing the date or the time that you called upon the Lord. Uh, Romans 10. Verse 
But the righteousness which is of faith, this is verse 6, speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ again from the dead, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So we learn here that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we express that faith by calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, a question that came up when I sort of uh, alluded to this topic when I talked about salvation, you know, and asking for salvation does not make it uh, works. We can ask for something. It's still a gift. But one thing I didn't really clarify then is, you know, we call upon the Lord, but this calling upon the Lord does not necessarily have to be an audible or an outward prayer or a prayer in a certain position, you know, closing your eyes, having your hands together. It doesn't have to be a prayer that other men can hear. I do believe we have to call upon the Lord. So it's not just something you say to yourself. It's something that you say um, to God. So we can see there that we call upon the Lord to be saved. But this calling upon the Lord does not necessarily have to be audible to other men. Now let's just go to Luke 6.45. It says here, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. Now my position on this topic is I believe that if you believe something, you will say it. You may not say it audibly, but you'll say it in your mind. And calling upon the Lord is something you say to God in your heart, whether or not people can hear it or not. And the reason why I'm addressing this is because some people take the position that you can believe something without saying it. And I don't believe that's possible. So they say, well, you know, salvation is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, but if you have to say it, if you have to call upon the Lord, then that's something additional. Now, I believe they are one and the same thing. And why? Because, because I believe your faith manifests in words. You speak you bring forth that which is uh, for the uh, sorry for of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So when we look at Romans ten, these are not two things that are happening. I believe it's just two angles of the same thing. If you believe on Jesus Christ, you will confess it with your mouth. So in that, uh, the way I think we should rightly interpret Romans ten is it's both the same thing. You believe and you call because when you believe, you will call because believing is calling uh, on the Lord Jesus Christ. So faith is manifested by words. I don't think it's possible to believe something without even speaking the words to yourself. Now think about that for a second. Try, just try it. Try to believe something without saying something in your head. You can't even believe that you can believe something without words, without saying those things in your head. Okay, does that make sense? I mean, try and believe, try and believe anything. Try and believe like that, that the staircase is white or the highlighting on the map is orange. Try and, believe, you know, try and believe anything without actually saying it to yourself. You can't because your faith, you see your faith by the words that you're speaking inside your head. And that's why when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll confess it with your mouth. Maybe not audibly, but I think you know, the analogy there is you, you say those words, but you say them in your mind. And if somebody wants to confess their faith to somebody else, they'll confess it with their mouth because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks it. So I don't think you can believe something without saying the words because otherwise you wouldn't even know what you believed. Does that make sense? Like, how could you believe something without the words because you couldn't even perceive what you're believing without the words? And I had a thought here I wanted to show you in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 13, that is talking about praying, but I think the principle is there. It says here in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 13, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, 
but my understanding is unfruitful. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit and I will sing with the understanding also. So what is he saying there? He's saying if I'm praying and I'm praying in a language I don't understand, then my spirit is praying, but I have no idea what I'm praying. Right? So I know I'm praying, but I don't know what I'm praying. And he says, what, what do I want to do? I want to pr- I'm going to pray with the spirit and I'll pray with the understanding also. So what I'm getting at here is, you know, you can believe something. You might know that you believe, but then how do you know that you believe? You, you might know that you be- you're believing something, but then how do you even know what you're believing without words? It's, it's almost like this. It's like your spirit is believing, but your understanding is unfruitful. And if you don't understand that you believe on Jesus Christ, how can you truly believe on Jesus Christ? Anyway, a couple, a couple of thoughts there. So I think that is why I do not believe that calling upon the Lord is something separate from salvation. When you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will call upon the Lord Jesus Christ because I don't think you can believe on Jesus Christ without doing that because it will manifest as words in your mind and if it comes out of you it'll manifest by words audibly through your mouth so what was the point i was trying to make there you know some people will say well i don't know whether i believe because i don't i I didn't like i didn't pray audibly because you know people say you need to do the sinner's prayer you need to call upon the lord but i I didn't do that you know i I don't remember a time when i prayed audibly or prayed with somebody so am i do i actually believe well no because you can believe without uh, doing a public prayer or, or, or an audible prayer, but I do believe in your mind you will call upon the Lord um, using words because you can't believe otherwise. All right, what's another uh, thing that uh, people sort of base whether or not they believe? We read here in Romans 10, chapter 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Now, this verse is saying that you won't believe unless you've heard the gospel. You can't hear the gospel unless somebody preaches it to you. Now, one way you could interpret this verse is it must be a physical person speaking to you in order to preach the gospel. And I think it makes sense probably at the time it was written because, you know, they don't have technology. They don't have a way that you can record somebody talking and then watch that recording. But is there anything different about somebody talking to you or if they were behind a television screen or behind a computer screen and talking to you? I mean, if there was no interaction, it would be exactly the same thing. It's like now, if there's no interaction, you know, is there a difference between you listening to this sermon online and listening to it now. Yes, your experience may be different, you know, because you're actually here, you may feel different. Are you in church when you're listening to it online? No, because you're not part of this body, but can you get the same information? Uh, yes. So somebody might say, oh, I didn't believe the right way because, you know, I just, you know, I just read a gospel tract or I just read an article on a website or I just listened to this sermon or this video clip online and it re- I realized I was not believing the right thing and then that's when I called upon the Lord Jesus Christ. But I didn't actually have some preacher come to me, open the Bible, explain it to me, pray with me. Did I believe the right way? And they might question whether or not they believe based on that. Well, you know what? I don't think whether or not somebody actually preaches it to you physically makes a difference whether or not you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because, you know, you, you believe, it's like going back to that uh, example about being born. I mean, you may not know, you know, the point at which you believe, but you know that you believe now. It's not going to change whether or not you can believe or not, whether or not somebody actually was there uh, talking to you. So perhaps, you know, somebody called on the Lord, maybe after reading a tract, maybe watching a video, maybe listening to an audio clip, or even uh, reading something on a website. Now, do I believe tracks can lead somebody to salvation? Now, I, I believe it's possible. You know, I'm not going to rule out the fact that they can't because, you know, I guess people have in the past. You know, they've read it. Um, it's given them some information. You know, maybe they've heard about it before. You know, you could argue that, well, they, they've always heard it somewhere. But even so, is it possible? I'm not going to rule out the fact that it's impossible for a, a written piece of literature, even on a website or on a piece of paper, could give somebody the information that they need about the Word of God to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So I think it can be possible, 
just because I'm not willing to say it's impossible. Um, but you might say, yeah, but tracks don't talk. You know, the Bible says like, you know, how should they hear without a preacher? And something that's written doesn't speak to you. So how are you meant to hear it? Well, uh, look at this verse in 2 Peter. And we've gone here before when I talked about the Word of God. But look at what Peter writes here in 2 Peter 3. And as also in all his epistles, so these are letters, these are written documents, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Now, when I alluded to this verse, when I was talking about the word of God, saying that the word of God was spoken, but we don't really know if all of Paul's letters were, were preached. I mean, surely they were preached in his mind, right? Because you can't think something without saying it, and then he penned them down. But then when he sent that letter, you know, somebody could have just read that letter and, this, and it's saying here that the epistles are speaking to them. So is it possible that something written speaks to you and you can hear it and that in a sense is the preacher talking to you? Because when you read something, you speak to yourself, don't you? So you're hearing the words that are written down on that page. You know, just a thought there, but, you know, do I think it is impossible? I don't think it's impossible for somebody to be able to read something and, um, and get the information they need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So I do think it's possible just because I don't think it's impossible. We can see here that written material can speak to somebody. Um, so you might ask the question then, well, if you believe that, tracks can get people saved well then wh why are we bothering to go talk to them you know like well if, if why don't we just mail out tracks and put billboards up and don't talk to anybody well the reason why we go out door knocking and, we, and i mentioned this is because you know i want to engage the people you know because uh something that like a written publication doesn't provoke may not provoke them to thought may not ask them questions and, and force them to think and engage them, answer their questions. So I, I don't want to just leave it up to them getting the information. I don't want to leave that up to chance. I want to get to them and talk to them and bring it up to them so that they'll think about it. But, you know, just because one method is more effective than another, you know, just because I think door knocking is more effective than maybe street witnessing or just handing out a gospel tract, I don't think that that then means that a gospel tract is worthless. You know, because just because something is less effective than another method doesn't mean the less effective method is worthless. I think it has its place. Because what if somebody doesn't talk? What if somebody is dumb? Meaning like they don't have a voice or they're unable to speak. Or what if you're in another country and you're unable to speak that language? Would you not give somebody a gospel tract? Would you not give them some sort of media that they can watch in their own language? I mean, even here, I mean, we, it'd be great if we could translate our gospel tracts into Chinese and everything like that, so that when you meet somebody in Chinese, you don't have to just leave them with an English tract. And maybe that's what I was thinking. Maybe that's what we can use all the different colors for. You know, so maybe for blue, we can have like a tract for Muslims, and maybe different colors, we can have different language tracts, so then it's, you can quickly see easily uh, what tract you're holding in your hand. Just take a couple. You know, would you not give them that gospel tract? You know, I mean, even though some of us might think, you know, say, is, is this track doing anything? I think it, you do, otherwise you wouldn't give it to them. I mean, if you, didn't think, if you didn't think gospel tracks did anything, if they were worthless, then why would you even leave that piece of literature with them in hope that they might read it? Um, and it would be great if we didn't speak the language, if we give something to them in their language, I think it does serve a purpose. So I do think, I don't think they're worthless. I don't think they're as effective as somebody who speaks Chinese, for example, talking to somebody, and reasoning with them and answering their questions and explaining things, no way is, is, is effective. So that's why we are not just going to leave it at that. We're not just going to give out tracks and wipe our hands and say we've done our job because we could be doing so much more. You know, there's a saying, different strokes for different folks. I don't know if you guys have heard that. So, you know, just because you didn't have somebody explain to you the gospel, maybe you watched a video, maybe you read something and got saved, that doesn't mean you are not saved. It doesn't mean that you do not believe. It's not a good way to determine whether or not you have faith. Now, here's another one, and I don't really even really have a verse for this, but, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, but I didn't come down an aisle. I didn't, I didn't respond to an altar call to get saved. Do I really believe? 
you know, surely by now you can realize, you know, the circumstances don't change whether or not you believe. And whether or not you calm down an aisle or respond to an altar call uh, does not change whether or not you believe. Now, my position on altar calls is, you know, I am not for altar calls. I am not for invitations. That's why we don't have them at this church. And I'll explain a couple of, I'll, I'll mention a couple of things about why I'm not for them. But at the same time, I am not against them. So I don't think that they should be called altar calls because, you know, we don't make altars anymore and the front of this room is not an altar uh, by a biblical definition. But let's say, let's say, let's, let's take away that fact. Let's say, you know, it's, somebody might say, oh, altar calls are wrong and then there's no altars. Why are you calling it an altar call? Well, let's say we don't call it an altar call. Let's just say we call it an invitation. Uh, invitations to respond to the message or respond to the gospel presentation wrong and sinful in and of themselves. No, they're not because it's, it's just a one method of which people can give people a, a, an opportunity to respond to whatever's being preached. So we can't say they're sinful. So we can't condemn people for doing that method. So I don't condemn anyone for doing it. But do I think it's a good idea? No. Am I for them? No. Do I plan on ever doing them? Uh, no. And, and why? Because, you know, one reason they give for doing invitations, or what, what was called altar calls, they'll say it gives people a chance to get saved. You know, maybe they'll be preaching a gospel message and they'll say this is a chance for people to respond, for people to uh, choose whether or not they want to respond to the message and believe on Jesus, on Jesus Christ. But two things there is, you know, or you, you could give them a chance to respond or you could just talk to them after after the meeting, right? You could just go over and talk to them and then that way there's a bit of interaction, there's a bit of engagement and then you don't have to give them that opportunity to respond and, and everybody that's already saved, you know, to go through that. And, you know, because sometimes people believe that, they'll give this altar call, this invitation and then they won't go up and talk to people afterwards because I don't know if you guys have ever been in churches that have altar calls or invitations but they give this invitation, oh, believe, if you want to accept Jesus Christ, come down the aisle or, or put up your hand. And then somebody does put up their hand. And then they're like, calm down to the front, calm down. This is your chance to believe, don't be scared. But then after everything's all said and done, they don't just go up to that person and go talk to them. I mean, for me, if I saw people putting up their hand, wanting to be saved, I would be getting people and saying, hey, you know, this person put up their hand, go talk to them. This person put up their hand. But there's none of that because you have to have your eyes closed. So you have no idea who's put up their hand. So you don't even know who you can go talk to afterwards to give the gospel to. And the person that saw the hand doesn't even go up and talk to them after they've given the invitation. And to me, that, that is so wrong. I mean, if you see somebody respond, they want to be saved and then you're making them come down an aisle to be saved. And if they're not willing to, you don't then go talk to them afterward. And, and explain to them the gospel, it, it's almost uh, foolish. So not only that, but, you know, we shouldn't even be giving, uh, I mean, church shouldn't even be geared towards unbelievers anyway. So, you know, the fact that the invitation is there to accept Jesus Christ as your saviour, I mean, it would only make sense if you're really gearing that public uh, meeting to unbelievers, and then you make let's say 99% of your church is, are believers and you take you know, 10 or 15 minutes to have this altar call, you know, now you're making all these believers sit through this 15 minute altar call or invitation when, they, when they're all saved. You know, why not give them their 15 minutes back and then use that 15 minutes to just talk with the person that actually needs salvation. So to me, it's, it's not an, a very effective method because you can just talk to the person and then, it, you know, it gears the meeting towards unbelievers, which I don't believe is the right thing. I think this meeting should be geared towards believers, building you up, giving you uh, some good, sound teaching that will uh, strengthen your faith in the Bible and in Jesus Christ. But, you know, they might say, well, it's, you know, we're not gearing it towards unbelievers. You know, it's, it's, it's a chance for a, a, a believer to actually respond to the preaching that's geared towards believers. You know, it's a chance for them to reflect on what's getting preached and, and respond to that. So that's not, that's not a wrong thing. I don't have anything against that. Um, that's one reason why they do it. But a couple of things to mention that why I would not do it. But number one is, you know, why does somebody need to walk down an aisle to respond to the sermon? You know, why, why can't they just respond to it in their chair? Why can't they just 
think about it afterwards and, and, and be exhorted to respond to it and respond to it in their own time. Because, you know, number two, a person might hesitate to rep respond to the sermon if they think they have to walk down an aisle to do it. You know, they think, well, I haven't really responded to it because I didn't go down and, and kneel at the front and respond to it, when they could equally just as much respond to it in their own chair, in the, in, in the, in the, in the quietness of their heart. So one thing I think is, are we stopping people from responding to it because they think, oh, I haven't really responded to it until I'm willing to go down the front, whereas they shouldn't have that hurdle to jump over in order to respond to something that God is telling them to do in their life. Uh, another thing is number three, you know, people might mistake this emotional experience. And, you know, they say it's not about the emotion, but, you know, it's about the emotion. Because if it's not about the emotion, you know, why, why is there the music? Because they don't, ha they don't have an invitation and it's something upbeat and something, you know, it, whenever they have an invitation, it's always something slow. It's always something, something emotional because they, it's almost like, even though they don't want to admit it, that's what they're unconsciously doing is they want to prompt this emotional response. And you know, one thing that's bad about that is people mistake this emotion, this emotional response as the Holy Spirit. But you know, you can have emotional responses without the Holy Spirit and emotional responses should be uh, in, 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 uh, in, uh, as a result of the Holy Spirit talking to you, not measuring whether the Holy Spirit is actually uh, moving in your heart or moving in the place so people mistake emotion for the Holy Spirit. And, and number two, you know, decisions in your life should not be made in the heat of emotion. You know, when you make a decision in your life, if you make it based on an emotion that you're having, it's probably not very deeply rooted and you're not really thinking about what you're deciding. You just feel something and you make this careless decision in your life that you're not really actually soberly thinking about. So, you know, I think good decisions and sound decisions in your life should not be made in the heat of emotion. And sometimes that's what invitations do, either after, a, you know, an emotionally stirring sermon or an emotionally stirring song or, or, or presentation. And, you know, one thing that's bad about prompting somebody to make this careless decision in their life under the heat of emotion is some people might make very careless vows that they are not serious about keeping um, and that's actually sin if they vow something to God in the heat of that moment and they're not planning on keeping it or they don't keep it it is sin to them you know let your yay be yay and your nay be nay you know because somebody might say oh you know they're, they're crying or whatever and they'll say oh God you know I'm so sorry I'll never do that again but if they're doing that in the heat of emotion do they really mean it you know is it is it better is it better for you to just say hey I'm going to strive to not do it again rather than making this vow making this promise that You'll never do it again when it's something you probably will do again. So I, that, this is a couple of reasons why I don't think altar calls are a good idea because I think first and foremost we shouldn't make people jump this uh, outward public fearful hurdle in order to make a response. And also I think a response or a decision in your life should not be done in the heat of the moment, in the heat of emotion. It should be done soberly and with a clear mind. And that sort of leads me on to my last example I just want to give in terms of these circumstances. But once somebody might say, you know, when I got saved, when I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I didn't have this, this emotional experience. You know, I wasn't crying. You know, I see other people when they get saved and they're just crying and they're broken. And, and you know, when they get saved, oh, there's so much joy in their life. To me, you know, it wasn't like that for me. I, you know, I, didn't, I didn't really feel anything too strongly. Uh, do I really believe? And, and this is in my own life. This was my experience. You know, I never questioned whether or not I believed because of how I felt because I, I've never really been much of an ex emotional person. So for me, salvation was more an intellectual decision than it was an emotional decision. So when I believed on Jesus Christ, to me, I just wanted answers. I wanted it to make sense. And to me, if it made sense to me, then, you know, if I was on my way to hell, then that's what gave me the emotion because I'm like, well, if hell is real, I don't want to go there. You know, I don't want, I know I deserve hell. Uh, did I feel bad about it? Yeah, but did I feel really bad about it? No, I was more, maybe it was more a selfish desire because I, I wanted to preserve myself from going to hell and I realized that this is my only way out and I decided to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because I did not want to go to hell. 
<clears throat> so somebody might not have this emotional experience, does that mean then that they do not genuinely believe? You know, and there's a lot of emphasis on um, what they call like sorrow and conviction. Um, you know, you hear this about a lot where they say, you know, you have to be sorrowful and you have to, the Holy Spirit has to convict you and then you believe on, on Jesus Christ. You know, sorrow and conviction might um, make somebody more likely to believe. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject to one another and be clothed with humility. For, because God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. So we see that principle there of if you're proud, if you're prideful, God might resist you. And generally God is resisting and people even who are proud resist God. So if you have sorrow and conviction, if you uh, humble yourself, yeah, you know, more likely you are going to believe on Jesus Christ. But does that mean it's a requirement to believe on Jesus Christ? Because you can believe on Jesus Christ even if you don't have the level of humility that people think you need to have. Um, let's go to John 8. Now on this issue on, of conviction, you know, I just want to mention this because people will say that, you know, the Holy Spirit needs to convict you and, and then only you can believe on Jesus Christ. Now nowhere in the Bible does the Bible ever talk about the Holy Spirit convicting. The, the one time the word convict appears in the Bible, it appears as convicted and it's in John 8 chapter, uh, verse 9. It says, and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. Because the verse that they go to to show that the Holy Spirit convicts doesn't actually say that. It says here in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. So you're not, con you're not reproved of sin because you're living such a sinful life and you need to be convicted of your sins to turn from your sins. You're being reproved of sin because you do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're condemned already because you have not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. So it says here that he will reprove the world of sin. He, reproving somebody of sin is telling somebody that they're wrong. Telling somebody that they're in sin. Convicting you of sin is what makes you guilt, what tells you that you are guilty of breaking it. It makes you feel that guilt. And that is not the job of the Holy Spirit, but your conscience bears witness of the law of God. And then your conscience, which is the knowledge of the God's law in you, convicts you and gives you that guilty feeling. So when it comes to conviction, it's not a work of the Holy Ghost. I guess it stems from the Holy Ghost because the word spoken by the Holy Ghost is what the conscience bears witness to and uses in order to make you feel guilty or not. Um, but it's your conscience that convicts you. Um, now, why am I saying this? Well, because, you know, your conviction is not whether or not you believe or not. Your conviction is a measure of your guilt, right? So conviction is a measure of your guilt. It's not determining whether or not you have faith. Let's look at this verse in, um, oh, I wonder if I was going to turn there or it was going to be later. Yeah, I'll get to it in the next point. But, you know, conviction is a measure of your guilt. It's not uh, determining whether or not you have faith. And, you know, if somebody's crying and they have tears, that equals emotion. That does not equal faith because you can have faith without having the emotion and the crying and the tears. And, you know, how you feel before you get saved, you know, this, your emotion, it, it's arbitrary, isn't it? It's arbitrary and relative. Because if you need to have this sorrow and conviction in order to believe on Jesus Christ, then your next logical question is, well, how sorry and how convicted do I need to feel until I can believe on Jesus Christ? And there's no answer to that. 
So if somebody says you have to have sorrow and conviction, it's, it's probably this arbitrary level that cannot be measured. So how could you ever know that you believe if you have to have some level of sorrow and conviction which cannot be measured? You don't even know uh, whether you have enough sorrow and conviction. So that point there was circumstances. So you know we're, we're answering the question, how do I know that I believe? How do I know that my faith exists? Well, number one, it's not by circumstances. And we went through a couple of the common circumstances that people will use or teach to doubt whether or not you believe. So number one, circumstances. Number two is emotion. And we sort of started to touch on this topic. But emotion is not only the feeling leading up to when you believed on Jesus Christ, but even the emotion you have after you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people will say, well, do I really believe? Because if I believe, you know, why am I so depressed? You know, why do I not have peace? You know, why am I so angry all the time? Why am I impatient? Why am I worried? Why am I anxious? Uh, let's look at a couple of verses there. Proverbs 28, 26. It says, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Uh, Jeremiah 17. We'll just read from verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. And we just skip a couple of verses, go down to verse 9, which is a very famous verse. The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? So it's hard to determine what your heart is going to do. So why would you determine whether or not you, your faith exists based on what your heart feels? Because your heart not only can deceive you, it's hard to know what your heart is thinking. And the Bible is saying if you trust in your heart, you're a fool. So it's, it's not a good way to determine whether or not you have faith, what your heart is feeling. And in fact, if we go to Philippians 4, I wanted to show you this verse here. Philippians 4, 4 verse 6, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. So be careful. So full of care, being worried or anxious. He's saying don't be a worryful about this. Don't be careful about it. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So your heart is not a good factor to determine something absolute like the existence of your faith because your heart can waver. It can deceive you. It's hard to know your heart. It's, a, it's foolish to trust in your heart. And that is why your heart needs to be kept in check. And we're given a few points here that, you know, we pray to God, we let our requests be made known unto God, and then the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep our hearts. And then what we think on, we need to think on positive things because that will keep our hearts and our minds right and on the right path. So our heart actually needs to be kept in check. Our heart is not going to determine things for us. Our heart needs to be uh, subdued and, and controlled, in a sense, to make sure that we uh, believe or we feel the right way. Now, how you respond emotionally can depend on a couple of things. And this is another reason why it's foolish to determine whether or not you have faith based on emotion, because emotion can be swayed by several factors. And one thing is I want to show you here in Romans 7, is your emotion can be swayed on the depth of your knowledge. It can, be, it can be swayed on how much you know things. What does it say here in Romans 7 verse 7? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had, sinned, that the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscent, concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death, for sin 
taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. So Paul is saying here that he didn't know whether he was sinning until the commandment came because he didn't know that lust was a sin unless the commandment said thou shalt not lust. And the principle I'm trying to get from this verse here is you don't know that you're doing wrong unless you understand that you're doing wrong. So it's the same with sorrow and conviction. Maybe you're not sorrowful or, con or, or don't have that feeling of guilt because you don't even know what you're doing is wrong. So sorrow and guilt can be a result of your knowledge about what is right and wrong. It may not be, it, it isn't whether or not your faith exists or not. Uh, let's look at another passage here in uh, Luke 7.36. And I won't read all of it for sake of time, but um, you know, this uh, Jesus is sitting at meat in a Pharisee's house called Simon, and then we know a woman comes and basically uh, cries uh, and and cries on his feet and wipes the tears uh, of her eyes off his feet with her hair. Now let's read from verse thirty-nine. When, now, when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying. This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a creditor, certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, which of them will, he, will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came, since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loveth little. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So he's saying here the reason why she's responding with such sorrow is because she realizes how sinful a person she is. Because, you know, maybe Simon the Pharisee didn't actually have less sins. I mean, maybe because Jesus is saying, you know, your sins are, his sins are little. But what I'm trying to say here is, if you don't think you have a lot of sins, you're not going to have much sorrow or conviction. Does that mean you can't believe on Jesus Christ, acknowledging the sins that you realize that you have? No, because sorrow and conviction grow as you realize the extent of your sinfulness. Because, you know, and that's why people that say that they're sorrowful and they have this conviction, it's not that they they believe and the people that don't have sorrow and conviction don't believe. It's just that they understand the law of God. Like Paul said, they understand what God expects of them and they realize how far they come short. But if somebody doesn't have that full understanding of what God's uh, requirement is in order to work your way to heaven, do they truly understand how, how sinful they are and will they have the same amount of sorrow and conviction as somebody that does have that understanding. So, you know, this sorrow and conviction, it can depend on your circumstances. Because maybe if you come from a lifestyle of sin like this woman did, and we don't know what it was, probably she was a prostitute, I think. She was probably a harlot. And that's why the Pharisee is saying, you know, she's sleeping around with all these guys. She's unclean. That's why you wouldn't want her touching you. Um, so maybe she was a prostitute. Maybe she had done a lot of sins. She was really regretting it. She realized that, you know, fornicating for a living was a really grievous sin. And this is why she had a lot of sorrow and conviction. But maybe the sins that Simon the Pharisee was com committing uh, were not as great as the woman's. And that's why he didn't have the same sorrow or conviction as this lady did. So, so these uh, circumstances in your life can change whether or not you believe. But you know, generally, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's good news. So generally, people will have a good response. I mean, generally, when you believe on Jesus Christ, you're going to feel happy about it because it's good news. Some people are going to feel happier than others, but you don't determine the existence of whether or not you believe the gospel on 
how you feel after you receive the gospel because it doesn't change whether or not you've believed. It's relative to each person. And again, emotions are arbitrary because how good do you need to feel after you were saved to know that you actually believed? And how long do you have to feel good to, to know that you were saved? Because, you know, what if you didn't feel good shortly thereafter? Would you then question whether or not your faith is there? No, because it doesn't change whether or not um, you have faith. And I'm not going to go too in depth into this point because I want to get to my next point. But, you know, you can feel good without faith. So doesn't that just prove that it's a, it's a bad way of determining whether or not you have faith? The fact that you can feel really, really bad, uh, oh, sorry, you can feel really, really good without faith just shows that it has nothing to do with faith. I mean, how many times do we read in the Bible... I'm not going to turn there, but Hebrews 11, it talks about, you know, enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. You know, sin brings you great pleasure. And that's why, you know, in Job 21, it talks about the pleasures of the wicked, how their bull gendereth, their children run to and fro and are happy. Hey, they're having a great time. Um, Psalm 73, you can read these later, it talks about the prosperity of the wicked. You know, they don't have trouble like the psalmist has when he's going through Psalm 73. We talk, we see in James 5, where it talks about the condemnation of the rich. You know, they have these pleasures, they live without wantonness, right? Without wanting things, and God doesn't resist them. So God's not giving them any trouble to remind them that they shouldn't have their, their eyes on this world, they should have their eyes on eternal things, because one day they are going to descend into hell and, and perish for all eternity suffer for all eternity if they do not realize that they need a savior and believe on Jesus Christ. So you can feel very good without having faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a bad example. But not only that, even with faith on Jesus Christ, the opposite, you can feel really bad. So because even if you have faith, you can feel really bad. How you feel is not a good determination of whether or not you have faith because as a believer, you can have very, very bad feelings and I won't turn to all the verses, but, you know, we have John 14, the Holy Ghost. What is he called? The Comforter. Now, why would we need a Comforter if we felt good all the time? And, you know, there was nothing to be comforted by. You know, in 2 Corinthians, you know, um, Paul talks about being comforted in all their tribulation. So we're comforted in our tribulation. Um, even when he was sending Epaphroditus to the Philippians, he said he didn't want to have sorrow upon sorrow. So sorrow is possible as a believer. So it's foolish to say, well, I don't have faith because why would I be so sorrowful? Why do I not have this joy, like the joy of the Spirit that uh, I should have as a child of God? Well, you know, not necessarily because you can have sorrow and we're comforted in sorrow you know philippians 4 4 says rejoice in the lord always and again i say rejoice now if rejoicing was automatic if you believed on jesus christ and you're just head over heels you're always rejoicing and you know one, you know people say well, once i got saved i was just so fulfilled with joy and i used to be sorrowful and that, that's a terrible way to determine whether or not you have faith because if rejoicing in the lord was automatic why would it need to be commanded why would God say, you know, rejoice in the Lord always? And again, I say rejoice. Is if you believed on Jesus Christ, it was automatic. Well, it's not automatic. That's why we're commanded to rejoice in the Lord. Now, I just want to cover one other, and then I'll continue next week. So we said, you know, the circumstances leading up to how you believe do not determine whether or not you believe. The emotions that you feel after you believe don't change whether or not you believe. And the last one I just want to uh, briefly go over is the desires you have after you believe do not determine whether you believe. Because somebody might say, you know, well, if I believe, why do I still have such a strong desire to sin? Why do I still have such a strong desire to do the things I did before I believed on Jesus Christ? Such a strong desire to not follow God, to not do the things that God wants. Um, how could I be? How could I believe? How could I be saved if those desires are there? And let me tell you why that's a foolish reason to determine whether or not you believe, based on the desires you have 
uh, the de desires really that you're focusing on. Um, not that, uh, we because we all have those desires. But you know, you know, some people. I don't know if you've ever had somebody say this to you, but they'll say, you know, when I believed on Jesus Christ, when I got saved, I just lost all desire to sin. Has anyone ever said that to you? And you ever think like how foolish that is? Uh, are they so blinded? Are they so blinded by their own sin and their own pride that they think, well, once I got saved, I, I don't, I don't have a desire to sin anymore. You know what? I, I, I only try and follow Jesus. I only try and do what's right. Let me show you this verse in James. I don't know if you've ever thought of, thought of this verse this way. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So what brings forth sin? It's the lust. And where does the lust come? Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So if somebody says, if somebody says to you, well, you know, when I believed on Jesus Christ, I just lost all desire to sin, my question would be, well, then why do you still sin? Because you're not, unless you believe you're sinless, Right, which surely, because you know the Bible says if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So we all have sin, but if we just lost all desire to sin when we got saved, why do we still sin? Well, we still sin because the desire to sin is still there. So it's it, it's silly for somebody to say, well, when I got saved, I just lost all desire to sin, and it's silly for somebody to believe when they get saved they're going to lose all desire to sin because we still sin. Therefore, the desire is still there. Now, why is the desire still there? Well, let's just look at a couple of verses. <clears throat> Galatians 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye, not, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. So as a believer, why do we still have the same desires that we have? It's because we still have the flesh. See, when we get saved, our spirit is born again. We have the first fruits of the spirit. When Jesus comes again, our body is going to be born again in the sense we're going to get a new body. But right now in this present moment, we are in still the same sinful body that has, is capable of the works of the flesh. And because we are still in this sinful body, we have this spirit that wants to do the right thing and we have this flesh that wants to do the wrong thing. So if it's, if it's possible for a saved believer in Jesus Christ to have the right desire and have the wrong desire, isn't it silly then to determine whether or not you have faith based on whether or not you have the right desire? Because you can have the wrong desire. So then you'll have bouts of thinking, well, do I believe? Because you've got these wrong desires. And then you've got bouts where you, 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 you have the right desires and you think, well, now I believe. So you're not going to be stable in your salvation because you're basing it on the wrong thing. Now, both those desires are there. You know, why then does somebody have such a strong desire to do the wrong thing? Well, it's because they're not walking in the Spirit. See, we decide whether or not to walk in the Spirit or in the flesh because those desires are always there. The desire to do right is always there. It's just whether or not you're focusing on it, whether or not you're choosing to follow that desire as opposed to follow the desire of the flesh. And the more you follow the desire of the flesh, the stronger it's going to get.
It's sort of like a drug, isn't it? The more you do it, the more it awakens that feeling. So we need to mortify the deeds of the flesh. We need to mortify that by walking in the Spirit. Now, if, like we talked about with joy, if walking in the Spirit was automatic once you got saved, why would Paul then need to say, this I say then, walk in the Spirit? Why would he need to command it if it was automatic? Because it's not automatic. It's something we need to do daily. We need to crucify ourselves daily. We need to uh, take up our cross daily and follow Jesus Christ because it's not automatic. So it's not just if I'm saved, I will live right and I'll do what's right. And if I'm not doing the right thing, then I'm not really saved. I'm not really believing. No, because it's possible for a uh, believer to have both those desires. And this is going to be the last passage I turn to, but Paul describes this inner battle that he has in Romans 7. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. What's carnal? I am fleshly, right? This is the flesh and the spirit, sold under sin. He's saying, I am, Paul, for that which I do, I allow not. So he's saying, I do the things and I wouldn't even allow them to be done. For what I would, that do I not. The things I want to do, I don't do it. But what I hate, that do I. So how, does it, how do we make sense of all these statements? Because the spirit hates it, but the flesh is doing it. And Paul is both of them. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would... I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. So there are tongue twisters in the Bible. This is one of them. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So we see these two laws here, the law of God. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So we see there as believers, we have the spirit of the, and the flesh, we have the law of God, and we have the law of sin, and we have them both. So this is why trying to determine the existence of your faith on the basis of your desires is, is foolish. So we'll cover uh, a bit more next week. So let's just recap. So it's not your circumstances, or how you led up, how, what led you up to believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not how you feel, whether before or after, because you can have good or bad feelings as a believer. And it's not your desires either, because you can have good or bad feelings um, so that's not how you know whether you believe and whether or not you know you have salvation.